Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Virginia Transit Association's webinar, FTA Region 3 Presents, What's New That Affects You? I'm Lisa Guthrie, the Executive Director of the Virginia Transit Association, and just wanted to let you know that we're recording this webinar, and it will be available on our website along with the slides for on-demand viewing later. We'll save all the questions for the Q&A portion of the webinar after the presentation, but we encourage you to send your questions anytime during the webinar. Here's how to do that. Look for the webinar panel on your screen and simply type your question into the question box. Although they will be answered at the end of the webinar, you can submit your question at any time and we'll hold on to them. Remember that the audience is muted, so we'll be unable to hear you during the webinar. We have a very important presentation today, providing you with a great deal of valuable information. Uh, Terry Garcia Cruz, the FTA Regional Administrator, will start things off, and then Tony Tyrone, Deputy Regional Administrator, will take it from there. Other presenters for today include Kathleen Zubricki, Director of Office of Planning and Program Development, Tony Cho, Director of Office of Program Management and Oversight, and Anthony Romero, Procurement Specialist. Thanks for providing this informative and very helpful information for us, FTA. With that, we'll, it's my, my great pleasure that I turn the webinar over to our presenters. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, I appreciate that intro. Good morning and welcome to our FTA updates. I'm Terry Garcia Cruz and I'm the Regional Administrator for Region 3. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. And uh, we are glad that you are participating in our webinar. It's really important to provide current information and relevant, relevant information. So we're hopeful that you will have major takeaways from what we will be presenting this morning. And there was already an introduction related to who will be speaking uh, at the various topics, so I will not be redundant and go over that again. Um, but we also uh, have a lot of people here in terms of resources from the regional team. And I know Tony Tyrone, who is our Deputy Regional Administrator, will also be introducing the regional team. And once again, thank you for your participation. We really appreciate uh, your involvement today. And we're looking forward to your questions. So Tony Tyrone, take it away. Thanks, Terry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Tyrone, and I'm the Deputy Regional Administrator for FTA Region 3. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Uh, before I get started, I just want to let you know uh, who's in the room uh, from the rest of the FTA team. Um, we're here, uh, and um, we'll be answering questions, hopefully, at the end of the session. Um, so these folks will be available as well. Uh, we have Lynn Bailey, our Civil Rights Officer, uh, Anne DeLecky, a transportation program specialist, uh, Karen uh, Rocher, transportation program specialist, uh, Ron Schatz, general engineer, uh, Michelle DeAngelis, our transportation program specialist, and Jay Fox, our regional counsel. And in addition, we also have the folks who are going to be presenting, uh, Tony Cho, Kathleen Sabricki, and Anthony Romero. So that's our team here. Um, all of the folks in this office, uh, they uh, work with uh, our grantees in Virginia. And um, we're looking forward to this presentation today. Um, we're going to start off, uh, next slide please. We're going to start off with, uh, actually it's going to show the presentation overview, right? Uh, I'll provide a brief update um, on a couple of topics that I think you're interested in. And then I'll turn it over to Kathleen who will go over trans uh, updates and tips. Tony Cho will talk a little bit about the triennial review process. And then Anthony Romero will talk about uh, procurement and piggybacking in particular. And then we'll have some time, hopefully, in the end for some questions and answers. Next slide. So the first uh, topic that I wanted to talk about was the FTA, the status of the FTA budget. Um, if you've been following the news for fiscal year 2017, yesterday the House passed a uh, bipartisan $1.1 trillion government-wide spending bill that funds the federal government through uh, the rest of the fiscal year, September 30th. And the bill goes to the Senate for a vote on Friday, and it's, ex it's expected to be passed. The Trump administration has already endorsed it, so we should be open for business um, next week with a full year appropriation. So right now we're digesting this 1,600-page document, and we'll be working to provide a full-year Federal Register notice with our appropriations and allocations as soon as possible. 
Regarding the FY 2018 budget, if you recall, uh, back in mid-March, the President released a blueprint identifying the administration's uh, 2018 budget priorities, and this was called the uh, skinny budget in the press, if you took note. The administration's blueprint is a high-level document that lays out some of the President's priorities for the fiscal year 2018. The budget that was released in March highlighted the administration's objective uh, to focus federal resources on maintaining current assets rather than continuing to build new capacity. And consequently, the president proposed changes to the Capital Investment Grant Program, the CIG program, the one that funds new starts, small starts, and core capacity projects uh, for fiscal year 2018. This includes the proposal to limit the fiscal year 2018 CIG funding to projects that had existing full funding grant agreements uh, with all future similar investments supported by local government uh, rather than the CIG program. The budget proposed in March was the first step in a lengthy process and includes many more stages before funding levels are actually finalized. So the complete fiscal year 2018 President's proposed USDOT budget to Congress will be published later this spring and hopefully it will include uh, it will include additional information regarding the FTA budget. But uh, it's important to note that, as in previous years, the annual budget and appropriations process will take some time, and it requires both the involvement of the President and Congress. So the full appropriations process could take six months to a year as the presidential budget gets reviewed by the Congressional Budget Office, the House and the Senate Budget Committees, and the Appropriations Committee. So on that front, please stay tuned uh, and continue to monitor uh, how the 2018 budget plays out. Uh, next slide. Okay. Just wanted to, uh, uh, before I talk about some recent organizational changes to FTA Region 3, I just wanted to highlight the fact that a new administration brings about changes in leadership positions both at DOT and at FTA. Uh, President Trump was sworn in on January 20th. And on January 31st, uh, we had a new Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chao. And there are four, there are four political appointee positions at FTA. Uh, we have the Administrator, the Deputy Administrator, uh, Chief Counsel, and the Associate Administrator for Communications and Congressional Affairs. And as of this date, none of those positions have been filled. And so over the coming months, uh, we're hopeful that the administration will be filling those positions of leadership within FTA. Uh, currently, Matt Welbus is FTA's executive director and he's the highest ranking uh, FTA official. In our Region 3 office, we've had some significant changes during the past year or so in both leadership as well as staff level. Uh, Terry has been our regional administrator since February 2015, and since that time, she's had an opportunity to fill key leadership positions in our office. And I'm proud to say that she's done so by promoting highly qualified individuals from within our office. In the past year or so, we've promoted both Tony Cho as the Director of Project Management and Oversight and Kathleen Zabricki as Director of Planning and Program Development. And we're excited to have both Tony and Kathleen as part of our regional leadership team. They both bring unique qualifications to their positions, including significant technical expertise and exceptional people skills. And they both meet my internal prerequisite for hiring, which is always to try to hire someone smarter than you. Uh, Staff-wise, we also have had a number of changes over the past few years that have had an impact um, on our grantees. Uh, however, those changes have provided us with an opportunity to bring on new hires, and this has helped us uh, to re-energize re our office. Um, two of those new hires, uh, Amory Resnick and Kelsey Smolin, are part of our office, um, and uh, they don't work with Virginia grantees. Uh, and Samira Lewis, I'm sorry, Samira Lewis is also was also brought onto our, our Washington, D.C. Metro office. So we're excited to have all three of those on board. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> okay, with a new leadership team in place about a year ago, Region 3 began a process to update our business plan. And over several months during the summer of 2016, the staff worked to create a business plan that articulated a vision and mission for our region and defined a path for excellence in service delivery. Uh, to that end, we have identified and are pursuing uh, several key initiatives, which include, next slide, uh, to be a premier regional office offering quality service to our stakeholders, uh, to provide timely technical guidance and oversight for our grantees, 
and to streamline processes for enhanced efficiency and to promote professional growth and development. And we rolled out our business plan in, two, in October 2016, and since that time, we've been moving forward on specific initiatives and tactics supporting its implementation. And one of the accomplishments that we are especially proud of and that will have a direct impact on how we do business with you, our grantees, and I don't want to steal thunder from Kathleen because she's going to talk a little bit about this, but we've developed a TRAMS reference guide to help improve grant processing, and we're really excited about that, and Kathleen will spend some time on that in her presentation. Region 3 expects to implement many more of the business plan initiatives in FY17 and FY18 as we strive to proactively guide our grantees towards successful grant submissions that result in timely distribution of federal funds while maintaining, while maintaining appropriate oversight of our, of our uh, federal funding. All right, uh, finally, I just wanna invite you to check out FTA's website um, and more specifically, uh, our evolving Region 3 website for additional information about our agency and our region. And you can find us um, at www.transit.dot.gov. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen uh, to talk about TRAMS, our, our favorite subject. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kathleen Zabricki. I'm the Director of Planning and Program Development here at Region 3. And I'm here today to talk about a subject that is hopefully near and dear to everyone's heart, and that is TRANS. Next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about some enhancements that are being made to TRANS. Um, we're also going to go through the new Region 3 TRANS Grant Development Reference Guide and what exactly that is and how it can hopefully be useful to you and also go through some TRAMS reminders and tips. Next slide, please. So it's hard to believe, but we rolled out TRAMS approximately a little over a year ago. And like any new system, we're constantly working to improve the system for you, our users. The next few slides, I'll provide an update on a few enhancements that we've made at the national level, uh, level excuse me, to date. Next slide. One of the recent enhancements that we've made is a new developer transmit function. When TRAMS was first rolled out, only the official could transmit the application to FTA for review. And we heard from our, many of our users that this was problematic and that it would be nice to allow the developer of the grant to be able to transmit the grant to us for its initial review. So that function has been implemented. So now you, as a grant developer, can transmit the application to FTA for review. Next slide, please. We've also rolled out a new disbursements report available on TRANS. If you go to the report tab in TRANS, you'll see the disbursement report available to you. You can query based on various criteria. When you do so, the query will be, a, a task will be sent to you in email and provide you with disbursement information. If you're looking for information regarding trans grants, you can query down to the scope suffix level of a grant. Next slide, please. We've also made improvements to include the closeout amendment function. You may have found that if you were in the middle of a closeout amendment, that you received two tasks to perform an FFR and MPR, and this became confusing to folks. That has been eliminated, and you'll no longer get that additional reporting task. Next slide, please. While what I just talked about were enhancements that were done at the national level, we in Region 3 are also looking at ways of how we can help to enhance uh, your use of TRAMS. And one way that we have come up with is we're rolling out a TRAMS grant development reference guide to help you through the system. We're going to be doing a Dear Colleague in the next week or so, so please be on the lookout for that. And we're also going to be posting the reference guide on our Region 3 website under Region 3 Resource Center. That way, if 
you can't find your email, or you have new staff who also need to, in the future, look for the reference guide. It will be available under the Resource Center, and we're also going to be looking at ways to better utilize that Resource Center in the future, so stay tuned. Next slide, please. So what does the Grant Development Reference Guide include? Well, it includes information such as what should you name an application in TRAMS? What should an executive summary look like? And what we've heard from a lot of people is, can you provide us with samples? And so the information in the Grant Development Guide has samples as to what you may want to consider including in your executive summary. We'll walk you through creating a project. What sort of information should be included for the project plan information, your budget and activity line items, and extended budget description. Uh, if you're familiar with putting together a grant application, this is where the majority of the information resides. There's a lot of samples in the reference guide to help walk you through that process and what it should include. And additionally, there's also samples of milestones. And I'd like to point out that these milestones are streamlined. We've heard from a lot of you that the information we were requesting was cumbersome, and we've really taken that to heart, and we have streamlined our milestones uh, for the future. So hopefully that will be helpful to you. Next slide, please. Additionally, in the document, you'll find a document attachment guide. This guides you through, program by program, what documents we're looking for in the grant, what should be attached. We also provide a funding summary sheet sample. If you're funding a project using multiple years of funding and you need to show us your full funding summary, this is an, a guide for what that should look like. Additionally, we have a lot of questions regarding the Section uh, 5307 requirement for security. So we're providing some information within the reference guide that will hopefully be of use to you. There's also a section regarding limitation codes. And you may be scratching your head, what's a limitation code? Basically, it's an accounting term, term but it means that it's particular FTA funding that we have that can be utilized for various sources. And when you're using those various sources in a grant, we need to separate them into two different projects within TRANS. So this section will provide you with a little bit more information on what limitation codes are and what you need to do when you're working with them in TRANS. The reference guide also includes a section on super grants, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail on what a super grant is later in my presentation. And then we also include our new grant review notification process. Next slide, please. So some trans reminders. Um, there's particular language that we're looking for in the executive summary. Now I will mention that, and this is my plug, uh, we are at the national level, level doing a webinar today. Unfortunately, our first session was scheduled for 10 a.m., the same as this. But there is a session number two at 2 p.m. today, and this, will, this session will talk about a new automated process for portions of the executive summary. Again, that's session two at 2 p.m. today. If you're not able to attend, the webinar will be available online again. Um, the, session, the section that will be automated now is the award period of performance. And I'd like to just point out that we're changing the way that we're looking at period of performance. The start date is now the date that the grant is awarded. That is different than what the start date used to be. The end date is the latest grant in the milestones. The start date is the date that the grant is awarded. That's going to be automated now. You no longer have to write that in the system. 
And then the la again, the end date is the latest grant milestone. We're also looking for designated and direct recipient information included in the grant application. The automated process will now walk you through it, and you'll need to attach a split letter if it applies to you. There will also be statements in the grant that will now be a checkbox that you can check whether or not your application includes research and development activities, and also whether or not your application includes indirect costs. Currently, you are writing all this information in your grant. You may have the question, do I need to change it if I've already done it? And the answer is no. The automated process will only be for brand new grants, and that is effective on Monday. So if you start a grant on Monday, the automated, you will see the automated process. If you've already started a grant, you can leave it as is, and we move it forward with the information that you've provided within the grant. Next slide, please. Just a reminder on applying for flex funds in TRAMS, um, your MPO should be programming the flex funds in the TIP. You should be developing a grant application in TRANS, and that's prior to getting the state to send the flex request to FHWA and FHWA sending it to us. We need to see an application in the system. We have to check the for the eligibility of the project that's being proposed to make sure that it is allowable under the program before we can accept the flex. We just want to remind folks because quite frequently FHWA contacts us about a flex transfer and we're held up because a grant is not in the system. If you think you're getting a flex, even if it's not 100%, you can go ahead and put the grant in the system so that we can look at it. Worst case scenario, if the flex transfer does not happen, we can get the grant deleted in trans. Next slide, please. One additional reminder um, is that we implemented this year in Region 3 a grant notification process. When your grant is ready for its initial review, please send an email to your grant representative letting them know that the grant's ready for initial review. Also, copy the FTA Region 3 grants at dot.gov email. That will help us at a regional level know what grants are ready for review. Next slide, please. And now I'd like to provide you with a few trans tips. Our first tip is when you're doing your federal financial reports and milestone progress reports. Our preferred reporting period is quarterly. If you have any remarks to make regarding your reports, and hopefully you do, please use the recipient remarks box provided in TRANS. If you're doing anything out of the ordinary, that should certainly be justified within your report. And please note that TRANS grants are susceptible to glitches. Unfortunately, you may have to work with the help desk if you encounter issues with TRANS grants. Next slide, please. A few tips on budget revisions and closeouts. It's always important to talk to your pro project manager prior to starting any kind of a budget revision. We want to make sure, A, what you're propo proposing is in fact a budget revision, and it could, in fact, be that what you're proposing is an amendment. And then B, it's always good to just discuss with your project manager what it is that you are planning to do. Um, ideally, if you have a closeout, we'd like them completed at the end of the reporting period. If you're doing any sort of the obligation of funds, please note that these require budget adjustments. And if you have closeout um, of grants, that uh, you've received a letter from FTA regarding the grant status, they can be complete at any time. You don't have to wait till the end of the reporting period. You've gotten a letter from FTA, 
Those closeouts can be completed at any time. Next slide, please. And finally, one last tip that I'd like to leave with everyone is considering a super grant if you haven't already done so. If you're looking for ways to streamline your grant review process and save you time, super grants are the way to go. Um, if you have a project that's being funded by more than one funding source, you can put that project and all of its funding in one grant. So again, if you haven't considered a super grant, talk to your grant representative and see if a super grant is the right way to go for you and your project. Next slide. And I'd just like to leave you with a few resources available to you when working with TRANS. The first one is always our regional office. When you receive a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, please note that the link in the bullet will link you right to all of our contact information on our Region 3 website. Uh, additionally, the help desk is always available to work with you on TRANS-related issues. And for additional information on TRANS, don't forget about the TRANS website. And now, I'd like to turn it over to Tony Cho, who will go through a triannual review process with you. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Cho. Again, I'm the Director of Program Management and Oversight here in Region 3. Uh, next slide, please. Today, I'm going to give a little background to our triennial reviews uh, with a few insights into TRs uh, from the FTA perspective. I'll start off with a few triennial review trends, uh, then I'll talk about our oversight assessment tool, uh, how we look at enhanced review modules or ERMs, uh, our triennial review workshops, and then finally a what not to do triennial review story, which is uh, based on some of the things that our staff has seen over the years. Next slide, please. This graph shows our most common TR findings in Region 3 from 2004 to 2016. Uh, the bars in orange uh, represent 2014, blue is 2015, and purple is 2016. Um, as you can see, the areas we have the most findings in are in procurement, ADA, and DBE. Our procurement findings have had a downward trend in the past three years, but everything else has been pretty much a mixed bag. Um, I want to point out this, uh, this chart to you in particular because uh, if you've had a finding in procurement or ADA or in DBE, you're not alone. It's pretty common. Um, I think everyone knows, you know, and especially if you were at our PSR workshop uh, earlier this week, that you know, procurement is an area where we have a lot of findings, as are some areas of civil rights. Next slide, please. This graph shows our triennial review finding trends nationally from 2014 to 2016. Um, many times a grantee will finish up a review and they'll ask themselves, well, you know, I just had X amount of findings. Is this a lot or is this a little? Um, without really placing any judgment on what a lot of findings are, um, the most common number of findings tend to be in the single digits. And you can see that here in the, the green, yellow, and uh, blue uh, bars. Uh, the average number of findings for a TR nationally is 7.43 per review. And on the high end, again, this is nationally, we've had some TRs with findings as high as 48 and 37 and 34. <laughs> Just like to know that was not a region three. <laughs> Those are not two region three grants. <laughs> next, next slide, please. So our oversight program starts with an internal program that we call the Oversight Assessment Tool, or the OAT. And um, while OAT sounds funny, it, used, it was originally proposed as the Grantee Oversight Assessment Tool, which was a GOAT, so good thing we kind of cut it back a little bit. But um, it's completed annually, usually in the early fall, and it's done by FTA regional staff, and it provides an assessment of risk for each grantee in a variety of different areas. Uh, click through, please. It's important to note that good communication with your FTA program managers will help our staff 
accurately complete their oath assessments. Next slide. The OAT identifies risk in areas such as financial management uh, and technical capacity, um, maintenance, DBE, uh, Title VI, and procurement. Next slide, please. So after the OAT is completed by staff, uh, as you know, the GERs are sent out to the grantees in the fall who are scheduled to have a TR that year. Um, they're completed usually by late December, and then we take the information from the OAT, and the contractors take the information from the GER, and then we usually hold a scoping meeting in January that looks at all of our upcoming uh, TRs, and including any enhanced review modules that may be needed. Uh, so the idea is that the OAT needs to provide the justification for any ERM that is proposed by FTA staff. And so that's what makes it really important as part of the process. Um, the ERM uh, lets us look and give a specific focus to uh, a certain area of review. And an ERM could also involve adding a subject uh, matter, matter expert to your review uh, with additional ERM questions asked for your focus area. And uh, there are areas along in our website and the FTA national website that does uh, focus on that gives you a sample of ERM questions for particular areas. Next slide, please. So some common triggers for ERMs include uh, repeat and open findings. Um, you may note that in some of the, the exits for your TRs in the past, we'll specifically note that there was a repeat finding. Uh, if there was a repeat, that is noted and that gets entered into the OAT, and maybe the next time around you may get an ERM in that area. Um, other review audit findings, such as single audits, uh, problems in closing past findings, including poor quality corrective actions. Uh, many times uh, the region, uh, in coordination with a contractor, you know, will really try to hone in on drafting our corrective actions that gets to the meat of the issue and try to help you as a grantee. Uh, fix uh, some of the deficiencies. Uh, complaints can be uh, a trigger, and this can be complaints from the writing public, or it can be complaints from, let's say, staff at your agency or from maintenance staff, things that they've seen. If we get a lot of those complaints, that could trigger an ERM. Uh, inadequate reporting to FTA, uh, for example, in your MPRs and SFRs. Um, single audits are missing or continuously delayed. Uh, numerous rejections or credits or refunds in ECHO. And then finally, major new projects. And I want to highlight that in particular because sometimes a grantee, uh, you know, let's say you've done pretty well in TRs for many years and you think you're, you're doing pretty well, but you're building a new facility and you haven't built a new facility in a long time. And so you may not have that experience. And so to us, that may be seen as a higher level of risk for us. And so we may request an ERM in, let's say, procurement, uh, just because of the fact that you're, you're building a new facility and you haven't done one in a while. Next slide, please. So we hold two triangle workshops per year, usually in the fall. Uh, one's usually in Philadelphia, and the other one is in either D.C. or the Northern Virginia area. Uh, last year, we had conducted the Virginia one in Richmond. Uh, just want to note that the workshops were for you are for you. Um, you can learn how the reviews have changed since your last review, and it's time for you, it's a good time for you to ask questions to FTA and the reviewers. And oftentimes, the the contractors that are conducting the workshops are the same contractors that be conducting the majority of the reviews that this year. Um, I also want to note that. For folks who don't have a TR scheduled that year, uh, you're more than welcome to attend. Um, let's say you have, uh, you've brought on new staff and they don't know the FTA program very well. Even if you don't have a TR, they're more than welcome to attend these workshops so that they can get their feet wet and get used to and, and learn a bit about the federal program. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our section we like to call a triangle review story, and this is with um, we made up a grantee called the Overly Confident Transit Agency, or OSCA. 
uh, is in Somewheresville, Virginia. They're located in a small UZA, and they're due for their triangle review this year. They have not had any findings in their previous three, three reviews, and so they're not expecting that to change at all. Next slide, please. So if they haven't had any findings in their previous three TRs, they don't expect to have any now. So uh, first rule is don't assume that it will always be this way. Um, there are always changing regulations and requirements. Um, you know, if you had, let's see, uh, one TR in a previous authorization, let's say under MAP 21, and now you're having one under the FAST Act, you know, certain things change from year to year. Um, the TR workbook every year actually highlights specifically the changes from the previous year, so that's a good thing to look at. Um, and reviewers approach trying to reviews differently based on changing checklists and regulations because of a dynamic environment. And, uh, and finally, you know, our contractors, they're not all robots. Um, they're human. Each one's a little bit different and looks at things just a little bit differently. So I think we need to recognize that. Next slide. The other one not to do, the next one not to do is never ever call FTA for help. Uh, asking questions is a very good thing. Um, our job is to foster compliance, and when we can't do that, uh, you can't, we can't do that if you don't let us know where you need help. And most importantly, uh, asking questions will not trigger additional reviews or scrutiny. So if you have some questions while you're filling out your GER and you're not so sure about things, um, you know, that's not going to raise a red flag for us. You can just call us and ask us, and we're not going to take down a note somewhere and say, oh, they didn't have this. Um, you know, we're here to help. Uh, you know, our job is not to give findings. Our job is to help you provide the best transit service possible. Uh, you know, we had an example recently here in Pennsylvania where uh, a grantee was filling out a GER and they didn't have, um, they couldn't find documentation of an incidental use request. They asked us about it. We found it in our files, and that was that. So it solved the problem, and uh, it won't result in the finding later on when we have to review. So uh, never be afraid to give us a call. Next slide, please. Many uh, grantee information request questions do not apply to us. Uh, all the questions in the GER should be answered to the best of your ability. Um, if something's just not checked off, that's just going to ask. That's just going to beg for more questions from the reviewers. So, uh, so it will result in more on-site questions, and uh, your review will go a lot smoother and faster if you're able to uh, at least try to answer all the questions on the GER. Next slide, please. Our reviewers won't want to be bothered with tons of documentation. We will pull files when requested. So during an on-site visit, you know, if you or your staff or the contractors have to constantly hit pause and leave the room and go dig for files. Um, that takes a long time. That slows things down. Uh, it becomes frustrating. And so it's very important to have all the documentation uh, ready and accessible uh, in time for the site visit. Next slide, please. We aren't sure what the reviewers will need, so we'll just provide everything. It's boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff. So it's, it's also not helpful just to take boxes of papers and dump them on your reviewers. Um, you know, it will take time to sort and review that. Uh, our contractors look through, as you probably well know, a lot of documentation, a lot of paperwork. So it's helpful to prioritize and organize everything before they visit. Uh, having, having everything readily available is great, but your reviewers will, be, will need to be able to find and identify what they're looking for. So, you know, if there's a certain document that they need and, you know, you can't find it because it's lost in the pile somewhere, you don't want that to result in the finding. You know, you don't, you know, if you have the documentation, you don't want the lack of organization to lead to a finding if you have it readily available. Next slide, please. Vehicle maintenance is an issue for Okta. Our vehicles are always serviced on or ahead of schedule. Early maintenance may seem like a good way to play it safe, but you can also get a finding for too early service the same way that you can get one for late preventive maintenance. I think a lot of our grantees don't realize that. Next slide, please. I wrote a check to the vendor within three days of my echo draw, but when did I mail the check? Uh, the release of FTA funds is not complete 
when the check is written, but rather when the check is actually released to the vendor. Um, so it's important that when you cut the check that you mail it right away. Uh, holding checks can cost you. The interest due to the U.S. Treasury will accrue from the date of the draw if funds are not released within three days. It's also important to note that when you do release those checks that you have documentation that confirms the release of those checks so our contractors can see the, the, the data and the information. And next slide, please. We will argue relentlessly on any and all findings. So uh, findings happen, it's not the end of the world. Uh, we were joking here that we were gonna outfit all of our contractors with t-shirts that just say findings happen. Um, uh, I mean, they, they happen, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, you know, you'll have some corrective actions, we'll work with you on closing them, and, and that'll be it. Uh, arguing with your reviewers on every finding won't change the outcome. And uh, honestly, if you're, going argue, if you're going to argue every point, you know, that's just not going to make the review pleasant. And uh, it's just be sure to, to go along with it because the outcome won't be changed. And with that, next slide, that's, that's it for me. And I'd like to introduce Anthony Romero. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Romero, and I'm the procurement specialist for Region 3 FTA's office. And I was asked to touch uh, on existing contract rights and joint procurement. And this is due uh, to a dear colleague letter that went out on April 4th of this year where um, uh, we had an agency that went out with an IFB with excessive quantities for buses and expected other grantees to jump into the procurement as a piggyback uh, and it was based on unrealistic quantities. They just had a number of quantities in the IFB and just wanted uh, other agencies just to jump in on the procurement. So we want to discuss uh, the difference between a piggyback and a joint procurement so that there's a uh, definite understanding what the requirements are for each one. Um, so that there isn't any confusion and that there isn't any findings coming when there is a triennial review or an ERM. Next slide. <laughs> okay, a piggyback is, is the assignment of existing contract rights through either on exercise options based on realistic quantities. Uh, the grantee uh, must ensure that FTA requirements were met during the procurement process, um, whereas a joint procurement is when two or more grantees use a single solicitation document to enter into a single contract for specified deliveries. The agencies are actually named in the contract as part of the procurement as a recipient. Next slide. Okay, excessive quantities. Uh, FTA has run into problems where uh, the assignments to specifically outside of, uh, let's see, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, excess quantities for assigning contracts rights are not allowed. Assignments are only available for inadvertent, inadvertent acquisitions, change circumstances, or honest mistakes. Next slide, please. Uh, you have to remember that their contract is your contract. Uh, you must confirm that the assignment clause for the base and our options, you must review the original contract to ensure compliance with federal requirements, including but not limited to adequate competition, fair and reasonable pricing, the Buy America requirements are met, and ensure the assigner did not procure unreasonable large quantities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Use of joint procurements. 
This is the preferred method over assignment. Joint procurements represent combined buying power and permits parties to, con to conduct acquisitions responsive to each purchaser's material requirement. And it still utilizes a single contract defining rights and responsibilities. Next slide, please. Again, you must remember that their contract is your contract. All recipients that participate in a joint procurement must adhere to all applicable federal requirements. It includes prohibiting against procuring unneeded item, items. All recipients that participate in a joint procurement are equally responsible for actions taken in response to noncompliance. No blaming the other agencies. So you must ensure that even if you're not the lead on the procurement, that all applicable FTA requirements are being met as well. Next slide, please. Avoiding disallow disallowances and litigations makes grantees happy. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, uh, so we're uh, hopeful that these three presentations uh, are informative for everyone. Um, at this point, Lisa, we're, we're done with our presentation and um, we have about uh, less than 15 minutes, I think, left in the webinar, but we'd be happy to entertain any questions uh, that the grantees have. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you all of you at FTA. At this point, I do not see any questions that have been submitted. If uh, you were waiting to submit your question, now is your moment to go ahead and type those into your question box, and uh, we will uh, see if there's any um, anything that's still out there that we need to address. Well, I don't see any questions, so I'm sure that means that everything was clear as a bell. So uh, if you have any questions, <laughs> later. So, so in closing, this is... Oh. Go ahead, Tony. Um, yeah, Lisa, I don't know if you wanted to mention um, that we're going to have a representative from FTA at the um, VTA conference. Right. I uh, will do that. Um, uh, this uh, cool. this uh, concludes today's seminar, and we uh, we wanted to remind you all though that we're having our annual conference and expo in Crystal City, Arlington, on May 23rd and 24th, and uh, we will feature a roundtable session on TAM, led by FTA's um, Mishadoni Smith. And uh, if you haven't registered yet and you're interested, um, a link can be found on our website vatransit.com. And I just also wanted to, I'm sorry, I just also wanted to add, Lisa, that uh, Karen Rocher from uh, the region will be at the conference. So if any grantees uh, want to meet with Karen during that time, you know, shoot her an email before she gets down there uh, to set up a time. And then obviously you can always uh, walk up and uh, talk to her face to face if you uh, feel necessary. And Jay Fox, our regional counsel, would like to say something. Yeah, the only point I wanted to make uh, uh, before we were leave today is I just want to pick up on the uh, what Anthony Romero was discussing in procurement. Let me make it a little bit more general. Uh, you, you saw that that's our that's our you know number one finding that we have, and I, I think that sometimes uh, problems arise when there isn't a conversation with the region when you know you uh, as the grantee are unsure about how to proceed, and so that's. That's the thing I want to emphasize, and uh, and I was the person that provided that last slide on avoiding litigation and disallowances. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, if there is any question you have about any of your procurements, we have a lot of experience here in this region, and we'd rather you step correctly. Um, uh, so, and and we have a lot of support as well if we're unsure of something and, and we need to tap headquarters. So please uh, don't ever hesitate when you've got a procurement issue. Uh, we, I think everybody in this room will say that we are most happy when we do get these questions and we're able to resolve your issue for you before you've taken a step that uh, sometimes you can't uh, walk back from because now you have a contract and, and there's, there's a dispute that involves a third party. Yeah, and Jay, thanks for, thanks for highlighting that. And I know Tony Cho also talked about the fact that, you know, 
please pick up the phone and, and call us anytime. In particular, he was talking about, you know, the GERS and the triennial process, but any questions that you have, you know, with anything that you're doing involving uh, federal funding and, and requirements, please, you know, we're here again to work with you. Um, like Tony said, we, we want to make sure that you uh, put great service out on the street. Uh, it's not to, to ding you. So um, give us a call, talk to your, uh, reach out, talk to your uh, program manager or uh, your grants person, or if you have to, Jay, and of course our directors, we're always available. So uh, please reach out to us if you have any of those questions. Terry, you want to mention something else? So in closing, this is Terry Garcia Cruz again. So obviously you've probably heard a theme here is, is reach out, reach out, reach out. Uh, we would definitely want to be a resource to um, our grantees. Uh, look at information on our websites. Um, as mentioned earlier, we have our reps who have a phenomenal amount of ex expertise. And so we thank you for participating today. And uh, thank you for all you do, uh, Virginia grantees. We know what you do in terms of quality service is extraordinary. And we want to say thank you. And we love being a partner with you. So with that, Lisa, thank you so much for this opportunity. And we will close for today. Thank you all, and uh, we look forward to seeing Karen and many of our uh, our members in uh, Crystal City in a couple of weeks. So thank you. With that, we'll conclude today's webinar. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.